So this morning, uh, well, Phil asked about a month or so ago because he knew he was going to be on vacation beginning of this week for someone to fill in. And I thought, well, okay, I, I can fill in. So it wasn't last minute because Phil was all of a sudden ill this morning. Otherwise, this wouldn't be happening. <laughs> I don't know what we would do with everybody else out this morning. But I was thinking of something to do for, for this morning, and a couple of things running through my mind, you know, things going on in the world. I thought maybe we should talk about this not being our home. Or Jenny was suggesting, well, do something on Thanksgiving and thankfulness because Thanksgiving's this week. And what ended up, I think Bruce in October posted on band uh, Romans 12, 9 through 13. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be uh, slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, and seek to show hospitality. And I thought, there it is. That's what, that's what I do it on. And so I'm going to this morning talk a little bit more uh, Romans 9 to 21 because there's a little bit more in that section in Romans. Uh, so uh, Richard Sibbs had a, a, a quote that I, I thought tied in with this pretty well. Um, there is no living member of Christ who does not have divine spiritual love infused into him and some ability to comfort others. Dead stones in an arch uphold one another and will not living stones. And he, he got that from 1 Peter 2.25. And I think that, that fits right in here with, you know, the first opening line of Romans 12.9 is, let love be genuine. So most of your Bibles, if they have headings in them, when you get to this section in Romans, it says marks of the true Christian. And as we know, a Christian is a person who's put their faith and trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ, including his death on the cross, his payment for his sins, his resurrection on the third day. So what does that look like? Not only to us as believers, but to those that aren't believers, to the outside world. Every month we do communion, we're told to examine ourselves. Are we worthy? Are we, you know, reflecting what a Christian should, should be? 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Matthew 7, 20, Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. And we've talked about that in, in Galatians 5, 22, 23, Love, joy, peace peace, excuse me, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. First John's another book that you can go through that, that outlines really how a believer should act towards one another. So today we're going to look at Romans uh, 12, 9 through 21. Uh, let's pray and uh, we'll get going through this. Father, thank you for this morning that we can walk through your word a little bit, Lord, and kind of expound a little bit on it and see how it applies to us uh, as believers, Lord. We're just, uh, again, asked to uh, lift up those that aren't here this morning. Uh, there's a lot going on, Lord, but uh, as, as we'll see as we go through these verses, we weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. So, Lord, we ask that this morning be edifying to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So before I get to um, chapter 12, I'm going to do a quick overview of Romans just to kind of set the stage a little bit. So Paul was excited and was wanting to get to Rome to see the church there. And, and he lays that out in Romans 1, 8 to 15. He'd hoped to stop there on his way to Spain. Uh, he probably wrote this when he was in Corinth, just prior to his uh, trip to Jerusalem. And he intended to go to Rome, like I said, on his way to Spain. But, you know, his plans were interrupted when he got arrested in Jerusalem and ended up in Rome as a prisoner. Likely, uh, the book of Romans was written between A.D. 55 and 57, kind of depending on which commentator you look at. But sometime in that time frame is when he probably wrote the letter. So you can kind of break down Romans into to four sections. Uh, most of the commentaries, even some of your study Bibles, will kind of break that down into sections. It makes it a little easier to understand. Um, I like Sinclair Ferguson, the way he broke it down. He actually, as I was preparing for this, he does a podcast called Things Unseen. It's a very good podcast. He'll take a theme every week, walk through something while he was walking through Romans. So I said, perfect. 
So chapters 1 through 320, uh, chapter 3, verse 20, uh, righteousness is lacking in the Gentile and the Jew. So that's how that section kind of does his intro in, in verse 1 through 115. Uh, awesome verse in 116 and 17 where Paul talks about his gospel. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to anyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it is the righteousness of God is revealed from faith, for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And then the rest of the chapter, 118 through 320, talks about belief, or man's sinful and lost condition. You want to see what's going on in the world? Read Romans 1. It's dead on. Nothing, nothing new under the sun there. Chapters 321 through 839, uh, they kind of label this, the righteousness is provided for us in Jesus Christ. Verses 321 through 24, we are justified by Christ's sacrifice. And it reads, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Chapter 4 goes on, talks about Abraham and his righteousness. Chapter 5 Peace through faith in our death in Adam and our life in Christ. Chapter 6 can be wrapped up kind of as died to sin. Chapter 7, died to the law. Chapter 8, we're no longer in commendation. commendation excuse me. Um, chapters 9 through 11, God's righteousness has been established in both Jew and Gentile in his providential ways in history. Chapter 9, God's righteousness established in history and Paul's concern for the Jews. Chapter 10, God's righteousness received only by faith. In fact, Romans 10, 5 through 9. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that is a person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, that is, to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, you will be saved. Chapter 11, remnant of believing Jews and the grafting of the Gentiles. And then we get to chapters 12 through 16. And this is how righteousness is realized in Christian believers, or how it's applied. So chapter 12, 1 and 2, renewing of the mind. I think we all know this verse. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And then chapters, uh, 12, uh, chapter 12, 9 through 21, marks of a true Christian, which we'll dig into a little bit more. Chapter 13, submission to authorities. 14 through 15, 13, life together as believers. In chapters 15, verse 14 through chapter 16, that's Paul's plans and his greetings, final greetings. So if you will, turn to Romans 12. We're going to go through uh, verses 9 through 20. <clears throat> Romans 9 through 20. Let love be genuine. Adhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, and seek to show hospitality. Blessed are those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Be love, 
Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. So I broke this down into uh, four points. Um, the first one, uh, verses, or, yeah, uh, verses 9 and 10, uh, labeled as genuine love. Verse 9, let love be genuine. Adhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love here that's used in the Greek is agape. Um, agape is the sacrificial, unconditional love of God. Agape involves faithfulness, commitment, and an act of the will. And, and in the Bible, um, love is expressed, you know, in relatively few words, but just different words, right? So there's New Testament basically uses two words for love, uh, phileo and agape, if I'm pronouncing those right. Uh, phileo is from, from which we get the city of Philadelphia, meaning the city of brotherly love. In the Greek, it's used to denote the affection shared by friends. Um, agape, on the other hand, is um, stands in more contrast. Um, again, it's it's the sacrificial, unconditional love of God. It's the highest form of love that we see in the Bible. Um, its most distinguishable feature is lack of self-interest. It proceeds out of a heart of care and concern for others. And you see this in First uh, Corinthians, which we've been going through. How much that we've talked about love in that in that book. Um, and it's more than just uh, mere emotion, right? It's an act. It's active. The calling of the Christian is not primarily to develop feelings of love for others. In many instances, that is outside the Christian's control. However, we can control how we respond and act toward a given person. The Christian is to be loving, to mirror the selfless love of God. And we see this in other verses as well. Um, John thirteen thirty five. By this. All people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. In 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 4, if we speak in tongues of men and angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong and clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so to remove mountains but not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy and boast. Again, this is all the same word in the Greek, agape. In 1 Corinthians 13, 13. So now faith, hope, and love abides. These three, the greatest of these is love. And we've been covering that through as we've been going through uh, Corinthians. So. Um, it's fresh on my mind when I saw it here. The rest of that, verse 9, Adhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. In the Greek, um, it's to dislike, have horror of. And I think this is probably one of those things we all have um, that feeling or that, you know, we're adhored when we see some of these things that are happening in the world, right? 9-11. Um, uh, October 7th, what was going on in Israel, uh, abortion, crime in our streets. We just, that just, you, you see that, you don't even necessarily have to be a believer and you're just shocked. But as believers, we're to hoard what is evil and hold on to what is good. Um, there was another story the past two weeks, you know, a teenage kid basically being beaten and stomped to death in Las Vegas. Why? That's, that's, that's a horrid. Right? That's just, it's, it's nothing but evil. And we see this in the world. We see this in our country with crime. We see this with things going on that just, you know, these people are lost. They're just reacting out of anger, which, you know, uh, as believers, we're, we're called to kind of, re re you know, hold that in, look at it differently from a biblical perspective. But you see these things in the world are just abhorrent when you see them. Psalms 97.10, O you who love the Lord, hate evil. He preserves the lives of the saints and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Verse 10, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. And brotherly affection, that's, you know, the Greek word here, we get to Philadelphia. It's love of the brothers and sisters and brotherly love in the New Testament. 
the love which Christians cherish for each other as brethren. And then outdo, outdo one another. In the Greek, outdo, the word there means to give preference, to go before, show the way, show deference, prefer. It's giving honor where it's due, but it's, it's trying to not necessarily, hey, I can do this better than you. I gave you know, so-and-so more you know, kudos for what they did, but that should be our mindset. Is trying to show honor to other believers when when we can, and, and you know, as they put it here, outdo one another. First Peter one twenty two, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Philippians two three, do nothing in selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Get to the second point I have here. It's uh, genuine service, and we see these through, excuse me, verses 11 through 13. Verse 11, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Uh, the word zeal here is um, spude in Greek, means with haste, earnestness, diligence. Uh, the NIV uh, says never be lacking in zeal. King James Version, not slothful in business. The, the NASB, not lagging behind in diligence. So it, it's, it's being zealous for what you're going to do to serve the Lord. Have that zeal. Don't, don't be slothful in it. And I like what Thomas Brooks said. He said, zeal is like a fire. In the chimney, it is one of the best servants. But out of the chimney, it's one of the worst masters. So... You know, from that same root word, you get zealous or zealots. You know, uh, you don't want to be a zealot. <laughs> Excuse me. You know, just completely over the top. But you're, if we're, you're serving, you're being fervent and servant, you're serving the Lord, and you should look forward to doing that, doing that without grumbling, without complaining. Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work heartily as working for the Lord and not for men. You know, that's whether, you know, you're coming down here to clean or you're, you're doing something else you need to do to serve the body. Um, it shouldn't be, oh, that's my duty to do this thing. The things we're doing, we're doing to serve the Lord. You know, from anything from nursery, cleanup, part of the worship team, uh, running sound, um, leading studies, passing out bulletins, greeting, setting up, any of those things, you're doing those for the Lord. You're doing them for his church, to benefit his church. 1 Peter 9, 4 to 11, show hostility to one another without grumbling, as each has received a gift used to serve one another as good steward of God's very grace. So we're called to serve one another, but not slothfully, not reluctantly, not dragging our feet, but that zeal knowing that it's the Lord that we're serving. Verse 12, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. William Grinnell um, had a quote here, love fills the affected soul with such inward joy and consolation that it can laugh while tears are in the eye, sigh and sing all in a breath. It is called the rejoicing of hope. So we had, you know, we hope and be patient in tribulation. We have some tribulations going on in this church right now, do we not? Chrissy's dealing with. We got Jennifer that we're praying for. These are these are tribulations, you know. When, and you have something medically going on that that rocks your soul, especially if it's something serious. And to have hope and be patient during that tribulation, because sometimes it's a waiting game. You don't know when things are going to turn around. You don't know when you're going to feel better. You don't know when you're going to get over that. And, and then, you know, there's other tribulations that we face. Everything from you know, family matters, work issues, monetary issues, all those can be tribulations. But part of this verse here then is finished with be constant in prayer. Because we know we're going to have tribulations, you know, in John 16, 13, I've said these things to you that you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? And from Romans 8.35. We're going to have tribulations. 
maybe not to the point that you know Christians had in in Rome where they're getting tied to a stake or you know fed to the beast or whatever it was but um, you know we have these other tribulations that affect us and they can affect our walk if we're not you know rejoicing in hope to get over that and we're not in constant prayer first Thessalonians 5 prayer without ceasing in Acts chapter 10 we read about Cornelius the centurion he prayed continually to God George Swinnick I ran across this quote and, and I thought it was spot on do not any day upon any pretense omit to offer up thy morning and evening sacrifices remember so often as you neglect morning prayer so often thou art all day naked destitute of thy spiritual guard and exposed to all manner of evil and enemies and thou forespeak thyself an evil day and so often as thou omits evening prayer, thou presumest upon sleep and rest and safety without God's leave, and forespeaketh thyself an evil night. So we should be constant in prayer. Constant in prayer when you get up in the morning, constant in the prayer in the evening before you go to bed. And this has been a challenge for me. Um, I'm getting better because I've made set times for it. Um, you know, whether you get up, you know, a bit early in the morning to do a devotional, read some of the word, it's important that you're in prayer. And it's not just, you know, hey, Lord, here's my list of needs I need today. You know, can I get all this stuff? That's our communication with the Lord. You know, we're praying to him as we're going through our, those of us in the study on the, on the Psalms. There, there's so much... Um, one, one, one of the things that we're seeing and learning from the Psalms, let me rephrase that, is, is you can see how, whether it's David, the psalmist in those Psalms, a lot of those are prayers. And he's unhindered by anything when he goes before the Lord. So you may read some of those and go, wow, can I really be so bold as to say that to the Lord? The Lord understands. And even if you don't know what words to say, he's our, our mediator, he knows. So you can go to him in prayer, you know, and, and that should be something constant. I find myself more now throughout the day if something comes up or something comes to my mind, whether it's somebody here at the church or somebody all of a sudden post a prayer request on band or, or just, you know, I'm taking a break from work and all of a sudden something comes to mind, I'll push away from the computer or find a spot that's a little quiet and just pray. And, and that's, you know, again, one of those things that I'm learning more and more, and I'm, I'm finding the benefit of it. Don't get us worked up over stuff. You know, it's in the Lord's hand. I gave it to him. We'll let him deal with it. Verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Hospitality, excuse me. Saints here, of course, he's talking about believers. Um, and as Paul, you know, wraps up his letter to the Romans, it, one of the things he says in verse 15, 25, at present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints. So that was part of the reason he was going to go to Jerusalem was to take aid to them. He'd been gathering aid and needs that the church in Jerusalem needed, and he was taking those to the church there. Matthew Henry in his commentary on this says, it is but a mock love which rests in the verbal expression of kindness and respect while the wants of our brethren call for real supplies and it is in the power of our hands to furnish them and I know I've been guilty of this in the past you know, there's some need somewhere we're all praying for it and there was maybe something I could have done more right whether it's monetary it's going over and serving it's meals you know this church is awesome with that if we have a need out there um, it's not just hey I'll pray for you oh, okay they got a night they need meals let me take a meal that night i can do that so it's more than um just you know contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality it's you know we can do more than just pray if we have the need or not the need excuse me if we have the the ability to serve them better uh, to fulfill that need we should be doing that hebrews 6 10 for god is not just upset so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. 
Matthew 25, 35, for I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. So it's not only the church and the saints that we definitely need to be taken care of, but you know that can speak to non-believers as well, right? Get, we, we've all seen that where people have a need, they're going through something, they don't have family around. It's an opportunity to us not just to share the gospel with them, but to you know share something more substantial with them and they could say, hey, those Christians are all right. They're helping me out on this when nobody else is coming around, nobody's helping us out. So, uh, you know, we recently saw that with the, with the Hanleys and their neighbor and, you know, them ministering to them, helping them with what they were going through. You know, those are the type of things we should be doing as believers. Uh, now we get to verse 14. Now, 14 is kind of, to me, out of place a little bit, and some of the commentaries think that too. Um, Blessed are those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. We're going to, and we're going to circle back on that. It seems to fit more with verses 17 uh, through 21. Um, and he's talking about those that persecute you and uh, persecute one another. In fact, some of the commentaries, you know, they kind of say this interrupts uh, the call to Christians to love and do good to one another and anticipates verses 17 to 21. So we'll, we'll come back to 14. But the next point I had was uh, genuine care for the body which you see um, in verses 15 and 16. And this, this ties in also with uh, verse 13, I think. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. 1 Corinthians 12, 26, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. And we should share in each other's blessings and good news. Right when you know when we're going through our prayer request and and we see that there you know that prayer request went to a praise, right? We're glad to see that. Um, you know, mourn with each other, weep with those who weep. You know, we've we've seen some loss the last couple of years in this church, loved ones that have passed away, uh, illnesses, surgeries, all those things. You know, it, it's nothing better than to see us as a church body come together in not just sympathize with them, but pray with them, be there for them. You know, Chrissy just got some bad news. Brenda's taking care of her, right? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's what you were supposed to do as believers. We've got to rejoice with those good things that we see, weep with them, you know, suffer alongside of them, come alongside of them. Verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Romans 15.5, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ. Haughty is, you know, you're thinking high, lofty of yourself. You're exalted on high. You're lifting yourself up. You know, another one of these was a little convicting to me because, you know, as I study more of the word and read more, you know, I, I see stuff online that you know maybe another believer post or and i just you know start going you know <laughs> that's not biblical or, you know but i got to remember okay they're still a believer maybe they're a new believer you know don't be haughty don't think i'm better than them because i know something different or i know better james 2 1 to 4 my brothers show no partiality as you hold faith in our lord jesus christ the lord of glory for if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and you pay attention to the one who wears fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, or you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourself and become judges with evil thoughts? Another one we could be guilty of, you know, first impressions. Sometimes they hold true, sometimes they don't. You know, look at our streets out here. You know, um, you know this country's got issues with you know drug addiction, homelessness. That that's not to say some of those that are homeless are are you know just as Christian as you and me. They're believers. They're out down on their luck. They may know the word more than I do, you do, uh, and they're just in 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 that spot. 
and then James here, you know, that obviously that must have been an issue. Um, but, you know, hey, you know, this guy, you know, he's dressed to the T. He must have money. Let's get, get him set up. Maybe help fill our ties up, right? You know, get him up front. The guy comes in in his sweatshirt and his sweats. You're like, eh, I'm kind of sick him back there. You know, that, that's not what we're called to do. You know, we're not supposed to um, do not be haughty. Do not associate, you know, we are associate with the lowly. Never be wise in our own sight. Um, Calvin said, let, not a, let us not lift ourselves proudly above no, other men, as though we were more worthy than they are. For we know that it is, it is our God that hath chosen us and set us apart from others by his mere goodness and free mercy. And we know our backgrounds. We know where a lot of us have come before we were believers, and we were no better than the, you know, the lowly that are, that are saved as well. 2 Corinthians 13, 11, finally, brothers, rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Psalms 131, 1, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up, my eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. And of course, Proverbs 3, 7, do not be wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord, turn away from evil. And one of the ways we can help do that is to be humble, right? Um, you humble ourselves. Don't, you know, carry yourself with the attitude of, you know, I know, or I'm, you know, look what I can do type of thing, right? First uh, Peter 3, 8, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. And in James 6 and James 10, 4, 6, 4, 10, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. So we should carry ourselves with a humble heart. And then the last uh, point I have here is genuine care for your enemies. And this one's probably tough for a lot of us. <laughs> really? We got to care for our enemies? Uh, we go back to, uh, you know, verse 14. Blessed are those who Bless those who persecute you, bless and not curse them. Matthew 5, 44, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. 1 Peter 3, 9, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. Puritan John Trapp said, saints must be Saints must be best in worst times. Pretty short and sustained. And, and that's, that's tough. Um, you know, we're, we don't see the persecution that, you know, uh, many parts of the world see. Not saying that we won't someday down the road. But that's going to be a hard thing to bless those that persecute you. Bless them and don't curse them. Verse 17, repay no one evil for evil. To get thought, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Proverbs 20, 22, do not say, I will repay evil. Wait for the Lord, and he will deliver you. Jesus in Matthew 5, 39, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Um, that's a tough one. Right, um, it, you know this 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 day and what we live in and all these things that we say going on. It's not to say don't defend yourself, right? But you find yourself in that situation where, um, you know, you're being persecuted. And, and, and again, I, I just kind of struggle with this one because it's like if someone smacks me in the face. What's the initial reaction, right? Here comes your arm, right? And there's a fire back. But it's it's trying to. You know, have that mindset of Christ, have that heart of Christ where your initial reaction isn't to strike back. It's to try to do what's honorable in the sight of all. And, and I compare the, the do what's honorable in the sight of all kind of like, you know, being in a car full of uh, Christians. You know, you're driving somewhere and somebody cuts you off and gives you the little wave, you know. <laughs> what, what's our reaction? Oh, yeah? You know, it's like, well, wait a minute. If I'm doing the honorable thing, I'm going to bite my lip, keep my hands on the steering 
<laughs> and not wave back, right? It's doing what's honorable in the sight of all. And, and that could, you could be in a crowd of non-believers, you know, and they're doing, you know, worldly things. They're talking as the world does in their language. They're cursing. But you're doing what's honorable, especially to the Lord, that you're not falling into that trap and becoming as the world and being, you know, dishonoring, especially to your Lord with your actions. Verse 18, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Peaceably here to make peace, cultivate or keep peace, harmony, to be at peace, live in peace. So as far as it's possible and it depends on you, in 99% of the time when we're going through something, dealing with some persecution or something, it's, it's going to depend on you, is it not? Matthew Henry in his commentary, even those with whom we cannot live intimately and familiarly by reason of distance or degree in prof or profession, yet we must, we must with such live peaceably. That is, we must be harmless and inoffensive, not giving others occasion to quarrel with us. We must be gallless and unrevengeful, not taking occasion to quarrel with them. Thus must we labor to preserve the peace that it is not broken, to piece it again when it is broken, the wisdom from above is pure and peaceable. And I think that nails it. Mark 9, 50, salt is good, but if we lose, if the salt lost its saltiness, how will we make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. John McCarthy said, Christians are to contend without being contentious, to disagree without being disagreeable, and to confront without being abusive. An example I thought of was, um, if you remember, uh, probably a year or two ago, John MacArthur wrote a letter to Gavin Newsom. You know, I check myself here. Um, Gavin had the billboard up around the country saying, hey, come to California, have an abortion. And he even put Mark 1231 on the billboard. The second is this, you should love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than, those, than these. It's like, seriously? You know, this, this man had the gall to do that. Well, John MacArthur wrote him a letter back and basically called him out told him he needed to repent, and he did it in, in a way that wasn't abusive. He, you know, he, he disagreed with him. You know, he wasn't being disagreeable, and he wasn't confronting him. He was just laying out, this is what you've done since you've been governor of this state. These go against biblical principles, and you need to repent. You know, it wasn't that he was, you know, calling, you know, brim and hellfire down on Gavin Newsom. You know, he was like, look, you know, these things are not biblical. You know, why are you quoting, you know, the second great commandment on a billboard about abortion? And, and that's, you know, what we need to try to do as well is we can have disagreements, you know, whether it's brothers and sisters in Christ or other people in the world, but we need to do it without being contentious. And I think we can do that because we have this here. We've got the word of God here that we can go to. And it's just a matter of sometimes you're just pointing out, it's like, hey, I go by the word of God. This is what we believe. This is where you're wrong. And that's not being abusive. That's not being contentious. You know, it's, it's, we see this, you know, in our country, some of the things that are going on. And, and there's a proper way for us to respond to that. Verse 19, beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And that's, he's citing that from Deuteronomy 32, 35. Vengeance is mine and recompense for the time when their feet shall slip, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and their doom comes swiftly. So our natural response, obviously, is, is to lash back out. But if we leave it to the Lord, the Lord's going to deal with those people when he comes back. That's what he's talking about. Vengeance is mine. He will deal with those people that are not believers, that are going against his word, blaspheming his word. You know, when they take their final breath, they're going to be in for a surprise. 
Romans 14, 19. So let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Matthew 5, 39. Again, turn the other cheek. Hebrews 30, or excuse me, 10, verse 30. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. So we can take heart that we can leave it in the Lord's hands. You know, we can get into these discussions. We can get into arguments with people. Can't convince them. You can't turn their heart. That's the Lord's job to do. But if we're faithful to the word, we can see that um, we can maybe change some hearts that way. And you see this when you go into verse 20. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. And this is cited from Proverbs uh, 25, 21, 22. If you're hungry, give him bread to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. For you heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will keep him. And I was sharing uh, with one of my cousins, and he says, I don't get that part about heaping burning coals on their head. Okay. Well, by doing so, you may lead the enemy's conscience to be pricked a little bit by the way you're reacting to what's being done. And thus maybe open up to his conversion, may lead to some sense of shame or evil behavior to what they're doing. There's a, a story I read, I think, on Voice of the Martyrs, and it was uh, in India. Uh, there was a village that um, this man, Raji, was his name, and it, in this village, they were extremist Hindu, and they always targeted Christians. And there was a young Christian pastor that would visit from time to time, and on one of his visits, Raji and another, uh, and, uh, another handful of um, the extremists there basically beat this guy almost to death, threw him in a pit, and then later that evening, Raji was kind of, you know, having some second thoughts about it, ended up pulling him out of the pit, him and his wife, for about four days, nursed him back to health with the intent of telling him, do not return here again. Next day, he was back. Long story short, Raji became a believer, and now that pastor is his pastor. And that was, you know, these, you see this a lot in, in where some of these missionaries are in parts of the world where, you know, they don't want Christians around. They don't want to hear about Christianity. But this young pastor's faithfulness to return and share the gospel and over and over again, and despite what he went through, that pricked Raji's heart enough, okay, um, that wasn't right. Let's get him well, get him out of here. The guy returns again, preaching the gospel which led to his salvation. So that, that's why we're, you know, you feed them, the thirsty, give them something to drink, you keep burning coals upon their head. You know, it may, the Lord may open their heart. You know, they might start to have, you know what, that wasn't right. Well, why wasn't that right? Well, the Lord's starting to work on them. You know, you're, you're taking care of that enemy of the gospel in a way that can help lead them to conversion. Luke 6, 27, but I say to you, excuse me, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. And that's what we're called to do. Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And that ties in with the rest of those verses. The, um, Matthew Henry kind of wrapped, wrapped these up pretty well. Be not overcome of evil. Let not the evil of any provocation that is given you have such power over you or make such an impression upon you as to dispossess you of yourselves to disturb your peace, to destroy your love, to ruffle and decompose your spirits, to transport you to any indecencies or to bring you to, to study or attempt any revenge. He that cannot quietly bear an injury is perfectly conquered by it. But overcome evil with good, with the good of patience and forbearance, nay, and the kindness and benefits of those that wrong you. Learn to defeat their ill desires against you and either to change them or at least preserve your own peace. He that hath this rule over his spirit is better than the mighty. So that, as we wrap up here, that's, you know, do you have that genuine love? Are you genuine in your service? 
Are you genuine? You have genuine care for the body. And do you care for your enemies? The toughest one. And some of these you can see in the world today, right? And we all, there's people out there that do good deeds. They give money to this, you know, the poor, the homeless, the hungry. But what's their motivation? Is it for their self gratification? It's like, hey, I got all this. I'm going to, you know, look at me, look what I can do. Um, some may do it thinking that it's good works that will get me into heaven. You know, our best works are filthy rags. Um, you know, we're not going to get there by works. But as believers in our changed heart, these are things that we should be seeing in our walk. You know, I, we talked about Galatians and the fruit of the Spirit and, you know, all those other verses that kind of point to us how we should act as Christians. It's not enough just to say, I follow Christ, but there should be a changed heart and a changed attitude, and that should be seen in our daily walk. And if you're not a believer, it's just a matter of putting your trust and faith in Jesus Christ and following him, and these things will follow. We do good works because we are saved by grace, and this is the things that we look to do.